So let's begin with the anti-glaucoma drugs. So the first class of drugs, the first class of drugs I will start with is the beta blockers. Now why I have started with the beta blockers because these are the most popular drugs. Most popular drugs which are used as the anti-glaucoma drugs plus most commonly used drugs. They are not only uh, most popular, they are also most commonly used drugs and uh, but they are not drug of choice. Now this is very important that uh, now these drugs are not the drug of choice because of certain contraindications and uh, certain problems with this beta blockers that you cannot use these drugs with certain set of conditions that is why now it is not the drug of choice previously it was a drug of choice okay. Now before going into the detail we should know about the mechanism of action. Mechanism of action of the beta blockers they are actually inhibiting. They are inhibiting the beta receptors. They are inhibiting the beta receptors and therefore they are decreasing the aqueous formation. Therefore they are decreasing the aqueous formation. As you know that anti-glaucoma drugs can fall into two categories. One which are actually decreasing this aqueous formation and another set of drugs that will increase the outflow. Outflow can be of two types. One can be the trabecular outflow, another can be uveoscleral outflow. So these beta blockers are actually causing decrease in the aqueous formation by inhibiting the beta receptors and these beta receptors are located on non-pigmented non-pigmented epithelial cells. These cells are located on the ciliary processes. They are located on the ciliary processes. Now what is the normal number of the ciliary processes? It is about 70 to 18 number and these ciliary processes are located on the pars plicata. They are located on the pars plicata Pars plicata is the anterior rough part, anterior rough part of the ciliary body. So these many questions can be asked with respect to the aqueous formation, the type of cells, then we have type of processes, number of processes, then the part of the ciliary body that is your anterior rough part of the ciliary body which contains these receptors. Okay. So basically they are decreasing the aqueous formation. Now we can actually divide these beta blockers into two categories. The non-selective ones which are non-selective and then we have selective. The selective beta blockers are selective beta 1. So these are the selective beta 1. Okay. Now the drugs which are non-selective. The drugs which are non-selective in this the most popular is the Timolol. The most popular is the Timolol here. Timolol is in fact the most popular amongst the non-selective beta blockers which is used most commonly. This is 0.5% drug which is used conveniently two times daily. Okay. Now what is the problem with this drug? This Timolol is actually contraindicated. It is contraindicated in the cardio pulmonary cardio pulmonary diseases. So all those patients who are having the cardio pulmonary diseases, it can be coronary artery disease, it can be COPD, it can be bronchial asthma. Any patient who is having cardio pulmonary diseases should not be given these non-selective beta blockers. This question came last year in NEET also, NEET 2019, which anti-glaucoma drug should be contraindicated in the patients of bronchial asthma, right? So this was the non-selective beta blockers, okay. Now suppose you are getting a patient who is having bronchial asthma, who is having COPD or uh, the CAD, anything and you want to give the beta blockers. So these patients, these patients can be given the selective ones. So we can give the selective beta 1 drugs to these patients. Like for example, we have got here, 
the bitoxolol like we have the bitoxolol so we can give this drug now though the anti glaucoma property of this drug is lesser than timolol but still it's a good option plus it has the advantage this drug has the advantage now what advantage it has advantage that it increases the blood flow it increases the blood flow to the optic disc so we have an added advantage also if you are giving bitoxolol to a patient we have the criteria of increase blood flow to the optic disc another important drug here is the cartiolol we also have the cartiolol so in selective variety we have bitoxolol and we have got the cartiolol now these two drugs are very good drugs and specially cartiolol will become the drug of choice in the hyperlipidemias in the hyperlipidemias so any patient who is having hyperlipidemia will be given cartiolol as the drug of choice now another important thing in uh, respect to the recent pattern of the questions they are asking you the adverse reactions what can be the adverse reactions of these beta blockers especially the non selective kind of beta blockers and uh, these should not be given in such conditions so in order to make it easy for you i have tried to divide it under a b c and d okay like we have a so in a we have got it can cause the allergic blepharo allergic blepharo conjunctivitis right so it can cause this conjunctivitis again a very frequently asked question which anti glaucoma drug is actually responsible for the allergic blepharo conjunctivitis then a for asthma too okay a for asthma similarly b b is for the bradycardia so this drug is contraindicated in cases of bradycardia also it is causing the blurred vision it is also causing the blurred vision okay then c c is for copd remember the cardiopulmonary disease then we have congestive heart failure it can also cause congestive heart failure right then we have got d now d say it can cause dryness right then it is also causing depression so we should not give this drug in the patient who is suffering from depression and also the diabetes mellitus now why this drug should not be given in a patient who is having diabetes because it can mask it can mask the effect of hypoglycemia so if a patient starts having hypoglycemia and he is taking the beta blockers too these effects will be masked and we won't be able to take care of him along with this we also have the spk spk is also caused by the beta blockers now what is this spk this is actually superficial superficial punctate superficial punctate keratitis so these beta blockers are also responsible for causing superficial punctate keratitis okay so this was about the beta blockers now coming to the second set of drugs the second set of drug is the prostaglandin analogs prostaglandin analogs which are presently now they are drug of choice presently these are the drug of choice so again a important thing the drug of choice is the prostaglandin analog uh, for example we have the latanoprost so we have uh, latanoprost we have uh, trevoprost and uh, we also have the bimetoprost we also have the bimetoprost latanoprost trevoprost bimetoprost etc the problem is that these drugs are not easily available there is a problem in availability plus they are expensive so if it is within the affordability range then these are the drug of choice recently uh, there was a question on this uh, latanoprost in the aims aims november 2019 they said that two and false type latanoprost cannot be used in bronchial asthma so that was false it can be used it can be used in the asthma if the patient is having asthma we can use but with caution 
So, you have to be careful it is not an absolute contraindication as it is in case of non-selective beta blockers, but you can use it. Okay. Now, what is the mechanism of action of these drugs? Mechanism of action will be the increase in the uveoscleral outflow, increase in the uveoscleral outflow mechanism, right? And what are the different adverse reactions of these beta blockers? Now, this is very important. The adverse reactions of the beta uh, prostaglandin analogs due to which beta blockers are used more commonly ever since the prostaglandin analogs are now the drug of choice still beta blockers are more commonly used. The first thing is that they are causing the hyperpigmentation. The first important thing is of the hyperpigmentation. This hyperpigmentation is occurring in the iris also, right? Now, if you are using it on one side suppose, right, and it is causing the pigmentation on that side. So, this can also lead to the heterochromia. So, this is one of the iatrogenic causes of the heterochromia iridis, okay. Then it is also causing the periocular skin pigmentation. Periocular skin pigmentation is also caused, okay. Then coming to the next one, the second important thing is the hypertrichosis. It is also causing hypertrichosis and the trichomegaly hypertrichosis and trichomegaly. Now, let us see what is the meaning of this hypertrichosis and trichomegaly. First of all, do you know the meaning of trichosis? Trico word means eyelashes, okay. So, hypertrichosis means what? We have the elongation that is increased size, increased size, uh, Hypertrichosis means increase in the number of the eyelashes, right? And megaly means increase in the size of the eyelashes. So, we have the elongation of the eyelashes. So, it is causing both and uh, though it is actually a side effect, but uh, it may not appear as a side effect to some of us because we all want the elongation of the eyelashes, more number of eyelashes. And uh, that is why now FDA has approved. FDA has approved the use of these prostaglandin analogs for causing this hypertrichosis as well as trichomegaly and now so many beauty clinics are there which are using this uh, prostaglandin analogs for these effects, okay. Now what next? Number three, it is also causing the uveitis. So, it should be avoided in the patients who are suffering from uvi uveitis or if they previously had an attack of uveitis because any patient who is having uveitis or the intraocular inflammation or the intraocular inflammation can again suffer from the attack of this uveitis, okay. Then fourth, they can also cause the reactivation. It can cause the reactivation of the herpes simplex. So, again this drug should be avoided in those patients who had previously suffered from herpes simplex because this attack can reoccur, recurrent lesions can occur in these patients and finally it is cystoid macular edema, especially in the patients who are predisposed, especially in the patients who are diabetics, having the diabetic retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy. This question was also asked last year. So, again this question is important, cystoid macular edema can occur in the diabetic retinopathy patients. Now, in these conditions where we have a problem using these prostaglandin analogs, it can be uveitis, it can be herpes simplex or it can be the diabetic patients, here what we are doing beta blockers are preferred. In these cases beta blockers are actually preferred and we are not using the prostaglandin analogs here. That is why though they are the drug of choice now, but still they are not the most commonly used drug, okay. Now coming to the next set of drugs, the third one, that is the alpha adrenergic analogs, right, alpha adrenergic analogs. Now these are the drugs which actually shows the double mechanism of action. These drugs shows the double mechanism of action. They are decreasing the aqueous 
formation, right? And they are also increasing the outflow, right? But still they are still not the drug of choice, but still they are not the drug of choice and this is due to their adverse reaction. So, this is again important point, though these drugs are the only group of drugs which are offering you the double mechanism of action, but still they are not the drug of choice because of the adverse reaction. And two very important things which occurs with these drugs, two very important things, one is the allergic reactions. The risk of allergic reactions is very, very high in these patients and uh, the second thing is the tachyphylaxis. Tachyphylaxis, these two things are very important. Now what do you mean by tachyphylaxis? The tolerance, tolerance to the effect of drug when used for a very long time. So you cannot use uh, these drugs in large quantities because of the allergic reactions and if you are using them for a long period, there will be tolerance, okay. Now coming to the classification of these drugs, again we can divide them into selective alpha 1 selective drugs and we can divide them into non-selective drugs, okay. In alpha 1 selective, again I can divide into three parts that is A, B and C and in the non-selective we have D and we have E, right. Now A means what? A is your apraclonidine. Apraclonidine which is a precursor of this C that is your clonidine, right. And then we have B, B is your brimonidine. These are three selective drugs and uh, these selective drugs have a different uh, utility at different conditions. Like if I talk about uh, this apraclonidine, this is basically causing the decrease aqueous formation, decrease aqueous formation and increase in the trabecular outflow mechanism, increase in the trabecular outflow mechanism. While on the other hand, if you see this brimonidine, Brimonidine is also decreasing the aqueous formation, right? And this is increasing the uveoscleral outflow mechanism. This is increasing the uveoscleral outflow mechanism. So both of them are decreasing the aqueous formation and both of them are increasing the outflow. They are increasing the trabecular apraclonidine and brimonidine is increasing the uveoscleral outflow, okay? Now if you see the third drug, Third, this is clonidine. Now, though it is an anti-glaucoma drug, practically it is not used. So, this is practically not used nowadays. We are not using, but it is an anti-glaucoma drug. And uh, this was also uh, as one of the options recently in AIMS, November 2019. So, you should know that this is actually an anti-glaucoma drug, okay? Now, what is the uses? If you see this uh, apraclonidine, this is used for before the procedures. Basically, it is used before the procedures in order to prevent the raised IOP. Like I can use it before the laser or I can use it even before the surgery. Surgeries that we are doing for glaucoma, like we are doing the peripheral aridectomy or we are doing the laser, like the laser trabeculoplasty. So, in all these conditions where there is a risk, where there is a risk of increased IOP, wherever we find that uh, actually there is a risk of increasing the IOP, there we can use apraclonidine before, okay. While if you see this brimonidine, now this is a very, very important drug because this has a unique property of the neuroprotection. This drug has the unique property of neuroprotection and if you remember what was the definition of glaucoma, it was the optic neuropathy characterized by retinal ganglionic cell death by the apoptosis. So obviously, I want a drug that can actually give me neuroprotection. So this is a very important drug. Now, because it is doing the neuroprotection, it is also a CNS depressant, right? It is also a CNS depressant 
and that is why it can cause the apnea, it can cause the bradycardia, right? And um, it can also cause the drowsiness. Now, this is again important and this was also asked last year that which anti-glaucoma drug can cause apnea? This is actually your brimonidine. So, that is why it is contraindicated in the infants. This drug is contraindicated in infants, but in cases of adults, I think this is a very good drug and rather it is the first drug to be given as a supplement with the Timolol or the other drug uh, when we are using the combination therapy. Like we have Biotim, we have Dim B, so many uh, commercially available are uh, their drugs which is offering you the advantage of the combinations of this Timolol as well as the Bremonidine. Okay, so this was about the selective drugs. Aptoclonidine, bremonidine and then we were having the clonidine. Now coming to the non-selective variety. In the non-selective variety, we have got basically two drugs, the D and E, okay. Now D stands for actually the DPV free. This stands for DPV free, right? And E, E stands for epinephrine. DPV free is a pro drug. It is a pro drug of epinephrine and therefore it is contraindicated in the systemic hypertension. If the patient is having hypertension like we have a hypertensive patient then it is contraindicated and because it will lead to formation of this epinephrine that can cause the hikes in the blood pressure right. Now this is something different because here I am talking about the systemic hypertension. The second important thing is that Depivifreen is the drug of choice in the ocular hypertension while this is the drug of choice in the ocular hypertension. Ocular hypertension means what? Ocular hypertension means where we have the hypertension uveitis. So, here I am talking about the local hypertension. Hypertension means raised IOP here and uveitis means inflammation due to the inflammation. So, if there is raised intraocular pressure which is due to the inflammation or in other words I can say that the patient is actually having the inflammatory kind of glaucoma. If the patient is having inflammatory glaucoma, then in those cases it is the drug of choice but it should not be given in the systemic hypertension, right? Then another uh, important thing is that uh, dpv -freen, right? Now this dpv is also responsible, both dpv as well as the epinephrine, both can cause the blackish pigmentation. They can cause the blackish pigmentation in the conjunctiva, blackish pigmentation in the conjunctiva. So, this is one of the causes for the conjunctival pigmentation like prostaglandin analogs were causing the periocular skin pigmentation. dpv and epinephrine are responsible for the blackish pigmentation in the conjunctiva. Okay. So, this was about the alpha adrenergic drugs. Okay. Now, coming to the fourth one. Fourth is the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Now, as we know that they are actually inhibiting the enzyme that is your carbonic anhydrase, right? They are inhibiting carbonic anhydrase enzyme and this enzyme is actually responsible for the aqueous formation. This enzyme is responsible for the aqueous formation. So, basically what is their mechanism of action? they are decreasing the aqueous formation. So, their basic mechanism of action is decreasing the aqueous formation, right? Now, we have got two kind of carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. One is the topical one, right? And uh, another is your systemic one, topical and the systemic. In the uh, topical variety, like uh, we have dorzolamide, right? And uh, then we also have the brinzolamide, dorzolamide, brinzolamide. And uh, in the systemic variety, the most popular is the acetazolamide, which is uh, popularly called as the dimox, right? And uh, then we have another drug that we can use systemically, that is your methazolamide. 
Now, methazolamide again was present recently as an option, right, in the AIMS November 2019, right. Methazolamide can be used as an anti glaucoma drug. Now, what is the problem with these drugs? The drugs are actually the sulfur drugs, right. Now, these drugs are actually sulfur drugs. Now, because these are the sulfur drugs, therefore, they will be contraindicated in the sulfur allergy. So, any patient who is having the sulfur drug allergy should not be given these drugs. And uh, one more thing which is important here is that these drugs can cause ciliary body effusion, right. Now, because there is a ciliary body effusion, this can actually lead to the forward rotation. There can be forward rotation of the iris lens diaphragm. There can be forward rotation of the iris lens diaphragm. Now, due to this, there can be bilateral secondary angle closure glaucoma. So, one very important thing is that which type of glaucoma can occur, not only with this drug, but with any sulfur drug. Like for example, uh, we also have the topiramate and uh, this thing was also asked recently in the AIMS, AIMS November 2019, that uh, which kind of glaucoma can be caused by topiramate. Again, that was also a sulfur drug and that is also causing effusion, forward rotation of the iris lens diaphragm and therefore the secondary angle closure glaucoma can occur in these patients. Then especially with the systemic drugs, if I am talking uh, especially about the systemic carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, then what are the adverse reactions that can take place? Now again I have tried to uh, divide them into ABCD. I have tried to divide them into ABCD, okay. Now what does A means here? A is the anorexia. So, there is a, a syndrome complex where we have an anorexia, we have fatigue, uh, we have malaise and uh, then we also have the metallic taste. So, there is a syndrome complex which is occurring actually with this patients. Then we have B. B stands for the blood dyscrasias. So, this patient can also have the blood dyscrasias. C is for the crisis. Crisis, what crisis? Sickle cell crisis can occur here, right? And then we have the D. D stands for your depression. So, this patients can have the uh, depression. These patients can also have discomfort, especially the GI discomfort can be there. We can have crisis, we can have blood dyscrasias and then we have a syndrome complex comprising of the malaise, anorexia, fatigue and the metallic taste. Uh, all these adverse reactions are very, very important and uh, that is why we never use these drugs for a very long duration. Uh, we are using these drugs when you require urgent decrease in the intraocular pressure but very effective one. Like for example, before, before the cataract surgery. As you know that uh, before any intraocular surgeries, the intraocular pressure should be low. So, before this cataract surgery, what can I do? I can give 1000 milligram dimox, right? Now, this dimox or acetazolamide is given in the divided uh, parts like 500 milligram I can use in the night HS and then another 500 milligram this can be given in the morning, right? Or the other condition where I can give this in the acute congestive glaucoma when there is an acute attack. So, when there is an acute attack of angle closure glaucoma, then also I can give this acetazolamide, all right. Then coming to the next category and that is your fifth one. This is your hyperosmotic agents, hyperosmotic agents. Hyperosmotic agents like uh, mainly we have got two drugs here. Uh, one is the glycerol, right and uh, another is your mannitol. Glycerol and mannitol. Glycerol given by oral route while mannitol is given by the IV route. Now, what is the mechanism of action? As I told you that uh, main drugs are those drugs which are either decreasing the aqueous formation or they are increasing the aqueous outflow. 
but here I have those drugs which are actually decreasing the vitreous volume. They are not interrupting the flow of the aqueous, they are not decreasing the aqueous formation, they are actually mod modifying the vitreous volume by shifting the fluid, they are shifting the fluid from the vitreous, they are actually shifting the fluid from the vitreous to the plasma. So, due to this shifting of the fluid, right, they can also cause the volume overload. They can also cause the volume overload. Therefore, they are contraindicated in the congestive heart failure or uh, we have got the acute renal failure. In all these conditions, they are actually contraindicated. We should not give uh, these drugs because the patient may be treated with the glaucoma, but he may die of congestive heart failure or the acute renal failure. So, basically these drugs are used as the emergency drugs. These are used as the emergency drugs whenever we have like a acute congestive glaucoma. If we have acute congestive glaucoma and we want to decrease the intraocular pressure at the earliest where the pressure is very, very high like 40 or 60 or 80 or even sometimes more than 100 mm of the mercury. So, in all these cases where you have very high intraocular pressure and you have to decrease this intraocular pressure at the earliest there you can give these drugs. Okay. Now, these were the uh, majority of the drugs that we are using, but now we have got a new class of drugs that are upcoming drugs as the anti-glaucoma drugs and they are actually the Rho kinase inhibitors. Rho kinase inhibitors, right. Now, these drugs can also be used as anti-glaucoma drugs. Uh, for example, we have got the Nitar Sudal, right. Now, this drug is a good drug. This can also be used as anti-glaucoma drug and uh, what will be the mechanism of action? It is decreasing the aqueous formation. First of all, it is decreasing the aqueous formation. Then it is also increasing the aqueous outflow because it is causing the vasodilatation. It is relaxing the spaces of the trabecular meshwork, it is increasing the outflow and number 3, it is also decreasing the episcleral, episcleral venous pressure. So, there are 3 uh, mechanisms of action and can you see it is actually targeting all the 3 mechanisms. It is decreasing the formation, it is increasing the outflow and also decreasing the episcleral venous pressure and uh, we have an important side effect of these drugs that is your vortex keratopathy. Vortex keratopathy is an important side effect which is also called as uh, cornea verticillata. It is also called as cornea verticillata and uh, this is actually a condition where you get the whirl like deposits. Here you are getting whirl like deposits on the epithelium of the cornea on the epithelium of the cornea. This is one drug, then we have got other drugs, you can remember it by the pica, right. We have got other drugs also that can cause this vortex keratopathy, like uh, we have uh, phenothiazines, we have the phenothiazines, we have uh, the endomethacine, we have the endomethacine. Then we also have uh, the chloroquine, chloroquine, right? Then we also have the amidron. And amidron is again an important drug to be asked in the exam. So, this is again important. Chloroquine is very important because chloroquine is causing so many things in the eye. Now, what are those things? Uh, chloroquine is causing the toxic optic neuropathy. It is also causing the toxic cataract. It is also causing the toxic cataract, right? Then uh, it is also causing the bullseye, bullseye retinopathy or maculopathy. Then it is also causing the vortex keratopathy. So all this is caused by the chloroquine. So chloroquine is an important drug, right? So I think these are the uh, important anti-glaucoma drugs. All the aspects of these drugs are very important, okay? Look at their mechanism of action, look at their indications, their contraindications. 
plus when you start solving the mcq it is actually the comparative study that is more important uh, rather than mugging up just the individual drugs because uh, when you are getting the question like uh, you get uh, this time in aims also true and false type or assertion reason type not only you have to see do these two statements individually that both the things are both the assertions are correct you also have to analyze that whether these are also the correct explanations so for that you need to actually understand why it is being uh, used and why it is causing this adverse reaction so i hope you like this video uh, give your expert uh, advice in the comment section and do let me know what are the other topics that you want me to discuss before your neat exam all the best for your exams thank you